You ready? Ready. Ready? Ready. Ready? Do it. Okay, here we go. Yep. Good evening, folks. It's Paul and Grace. Yes, I'm here too. And this is uh, the podcast for uh, February. February? February. February. Third. Well, tomorrow's the fourth. Fourth. February 4th. 2018. Fine. And we're getting it uh, recorded uh, a day early. Woohoo! <laughs> so uh, we're we're doing we're way ahead of the game. Ahead of the game here, guys. Yeah. Except now that we're doing this, we haven't we don't have a walk to talk about. We don't have a walk to talk about because we last we usually walk on Sundays. Yeah, and then record after the walk. But you know, this is actually not a good weekend for walking. Not really. No, it's cold and windy and occasional snow, snow showers. showers. So yeah, yeah, it's and also. My, uh, my knee is kind of messed up. Oh, that's right. And it's not really, you don't really want to put too much work on it. Right I'm now. not supposed to. I'm supposed to, uh, I'm supposed to rice it. Supposed to rice it for how long? Um, another week, another week I guess. So, and then. It's so probably no, no, uh, walks for a little bit, guys. Yeah. So I, I had this, uh, incident. I had this little incident where <clears throat> I was driving home and I, uh, did as I usually do, which is I uh, stopped the car and got out to get the mail before I then get back in the car and turn down our little driveway off Crane. Yeah. Uh, and somehow as I did this, I failed to put the car in park. Yeah. And so it was also icy. Yeah. Slippery, slidey. And so I had a strange combination of I'm stepping out of the car to get the mail. Uh, my foot slips on the ice, and the car starts rolling away from me. <laughs> Which is, yeah, comic, <clears throat> and but dangerous. Yeah. So somehow, within in all that, my right leg was still inside the car, kind of still actually wedged under the steering wheel, and I fell and torqued my leg with quite a bit of force. Yeah. And uh, it hurt a lot then. Yeah, yeah. And I was actually worried that I had broken something. Something somehow, right. Um, then. But it started to feel better pretty quickly. Yeah. It was, the swelling was not bad. Um, it, was, it was a little bruised, actually. Yeah, a little bruised, a little swollen. And I thought, okay, well, it's not really broken. I'll just keep an eye on it. You know, it might could be a tiny fracture or something. But then, uh, fast forward a week. Fast forward a week, and then last Sunday we went out walking, mm-hmm. and I, for part of that walk, I carried Benjamin on my back for eh, maybe seventy five percent of it. Yeah, yeah. And maybe for two miles or so. I don't. Know. It was yeah, for, a long, a for a long while, and he weighs forty pounds. Yeah, and my my knee wasn't completely healed, and then that you know, even if I hadn't been injured at all, that would have made me sore. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> So, but it was then really sore. It really, was really painful. Yeah. And then I didn't go, didn't do anything about it, didn't do anything about it. I was like, oh, I don't want to go because if it is broken, they're going to do all this stuff. Stuff. It's going to take forever. I'm going to have to wait forever. But I finally went to an urgent care clinic mm-hmm. and they did take an x ray and examine it. Uh, and um, they say that there's not a break. Yeah. So. Uh, I looked at the X-rays. It, there's, I'll say that there's no, there's no blatant, no br- obvious break, break. Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But um, uh, I'm having a slight dispute with the radiologist. <laughs> I think there's actually a, a hairline crack in in the head of uh, the tibia. Oh, yeah, yeah. But um, I, I can't. You know, I'm not qualified to say for sure. But I saw it on the X-ray. Right, and then um, it's also it's also visibly swollen. Visibly swollen, but I think the here's the thing though the treatment the treatment's plan the, same. Treatment's yeah, the same. Yeah, it's not. So I mean, it's it's already partially healed if right. it is a crack. So it's just uh, ice and anti-inflammatories and trying to stay off it. Stay off it. Pressure and wrap it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, rice. Rice it up. So that's what I'm doing. So I. Probably wouldn't want to go for a walk tomorrow anyway. Anyway, even in you know, good winter weather. Yeah. And now, mind you, personally, I'd be all about a winter walk and light snow. 
in a winter wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> my kids, however, would be less enthusiastic. Oh, the snow is blowing in my eyes. I can't stand it. my hair. I won't uh, wear it. Yeah, that'll happen. Yeah, so, yeah, we're not going to go there. So, uh, yeah, probably we're not going to have a walk this week. So That's the sad part. Are we, are we reading anything? Is anything going on like that? Um, I'm continuing to read this uh, long, rambling novel. Is called, there, a, called is there any other kind I'm that I read? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <coughs> called uh, Existence by David Brin. Hmm. He's a science fiction author. Uh, he's best known for uh, like um, the Uplift books, mm-hmm. um, which won Hugo and Nebula awards. He's award winning, mm-hmm. but this novel is like almost a thousand pages and it's really rambling and it reads like uh a telephone book in elvish uh, not exactly oh, okay. it's it's like um it's kind of become he's kind of a futurist mm-hmm. so he's uh, follows all these trends right but um in this book he didn't turn them into like a novel right and so he keeps dropping into uh, notes from some future thing, which is like some future version of Wikipedia or something. And so uh-huh. it's, and some t- places in the book, clearly he was working in some kind of outliner program. Like there are these programs right. for novelists, these like writing tools oh, yes, for yes. novelists mm-hmm. that let you link in all your notes and they're all hyperlinked right. together. Right. And I think somehow he exported the text into Microsoft Word or whatever. and It just got printed. It just got printed because there are hyperlinks in the text. Like what? there are places in these, <laughs> in like these encyclopedia entry things where certain terms have dotted underlines, like very faint dotted underlines, like they were a blue hyperlink or something. Boy, maybe that's supposed to be, bring realism to the uh, text. Like you're actually reading the page? It's only in a few places, so I think oh. it's actually a, a, a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's like it's like three. The other thing he does is this kind of thing that's still trendy, and I wish the trend would just die, which is um, you write three novels, and then I, you chop them up and interleave them to make a really long book. One long book. Right, and the characters, maybe they meet up, maybe they don't, but they're connected by events or something oh, right. going on. And so it's three, It's the length of three novels, honestly. Because that's better. Uh, yeah, and then, um, and one of them, God help me. Uh, God help me. <laughs> God help <laughs> me. <laughs> one, of, one of them is the, uh, basically an Uplift series book, and halfway through the thing, and now I'm in a chapter where the protagonist of the chapter, not the whole arc, mm-hmm. um, are sentient dolphins. Oh. And they're... Uh, are they talking? They're talking to oh, each other, talking. and they're transcribing it. And this is something, actually, that I just kind of loathe in science fiction is anthropomorphized animals. How are the dolphins transcribing? Who, <laughs> who's taking notes? <laughs> who's taking notes? Their notepads would be all soggy. <laughs> all wet? Are they like <sighs> are they like doing nose taps on a computer? Uh, you know what? I didn't even think of that because just the thing itself is so annoying that I didn't even think about that. I'm just, uh, you know. I mean, that's just, uh, but you know, most... In a lot of novels, there a lot. Of, so the modern sort of uh, trend in, uh, I guess, narrative voice is like what's called a free indirect, mm-hmm. where the narrative uh, perspective just kind of wanders around in and out of characters' heads, and oh. that's become so common that I don't even like notice it anymore. That seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, it's very common where you'll, you'll get inside a character's head and then the narrative will go off and recount a bunch of facts and a bunch of things that are going on in the physical world. Right. But there's not a, uh, it's not a character in the book who's, who is the narrator, you know? So, oh. 
Okay. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> Sounds modern. It, it is modern, <clears throat> but it's become such a commonplace that it's I... It's become a norm. Yeah. But, no, I've, I've always kind of been um, a little horrified by science fiction novels where the characters are augmented apes... Or dolphins, or you know, but Planet of the Apes is a great movie. Well, but that's different. That's like uh, they discover, mm-hmm. you know, a bunch of humans discover a planet where you know where the the characters are uh, evolved apes. Oh, they they didn't evolve to humans. They remained apes, and they, yeah, they they rem- they are actually chimpanzees and and gorillas. You know, that are living together. <laughs> They're like this. This is how okay. So Pierre Boulle's novel, the novel for Planet of the Apes, Pierre Boulle is it's actually really good. It's a good novel. I read it a long time ago. Mm-hmm. It was great source material, and it's it's worth reading as a novel. It's an allegory about race relations, and you know, and, well, and yeah. militarism and the police state and all this, and, right. uh, you know. But um, it's uh, th- this is not that. This is science fiction where. Humans have messed around with dolphins' DNA or something, and now they're they raised their intelligence slightly, and now they can can talk and communicate and type on keyboards and stuff like that, you know. Mm. But you're always then in the dolphins' point of view now in this chapter, and I'm like, I really don't care about the dolphins' point of view, honestly. As long as it's not my tuna. <laughs> it's... This is just endless, and it's just annoying. Yeah. And there's three other plot lines I'm trying to follow, follow too. <laughs> now the dolphins, and now the dolphins are swimming around, and they're they're joking with each other, and they're mocking each other's appearance, and they're talking about this sexy female dolphin that's you know in heat now. And I'm like, just kill me, my god! <laughs> Wait, so this is the tenth grade with the dolphins? Jeez, oh, they are like 10th dolphins grade. in tenth yeah. grade. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wearing their, you know, Jordash jeans or something. I, I, no, no, Jord- Jordash flippers. Jordash flippers. <laughs> I don't know. Did you see her flippers? Oh, my God. Is she wearing that? Anyway, the, so the reason I'm reading this is it's a it's a it's um, an alien first contact story, right? Oh, first contact stories are fun. Yeah, except this is dragging all the, like, draining all the fun and excitement out of what ought to have been a 400-page max Page turner, first contact page turner, right? Right. By chopping it up with dolphins, Wikipedia from the year twenty forty, and a bunch of extraneous narrative about and intelligent dolphins. dolphins. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And you know, so, so anyway, I, I get really sick of this intercutting because the net effect is you cease to care about any of the individual stories because in another ten pages you're going to leave it behind, you know. Right. Pick it up later or yeah. something. So, anyway, I didn't mean to get onto. Well, a, I wonder what you're reading. I, yeah, as usual, I'm not reading anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm still working through my pattern making book. Okay. No, I, this book. I'm I'm frustrated with this book because it's taken me forever. It's taken me weeks and weeks to get even halfway through it. Oh, yeah. And I can usually, I mean, I, I usually was finishing basically uh, a book a week. Yeah. And that's that sort of was my average for the last few years. Mm-hmm. Picking up a book like this, that's taken me like three weeks to get halfway, halfway through it. Through it is really really a slog it's a slog and it's it's not only that just that it's messing with my average because it's not shouldn't really be about my numbers right yeah but it's about no it's more like i'm feeling like i'm into this now i should finish it because i'm curious about the first contact story Mm -hmm. but um i really feel like i wasted a lot of reading time on this book when i could have used that time for other books. I could have been reading The Conquest of Bread, you know. I could yeah. have been reading... Uh, yeah, maybe you just put it down and pick up The Conquest of Bread. I know. I just... I kind of get... You know, ha- when, you're, when you've when passed the halfway point, you're like, well, you know, I should finish it. Just finish it downhill. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, so I'm I'm well along. I'm actually um, working on a pattern for a skirt. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you'll turn it to clothes eventually. That'll be exciting. 
You've got a seed catalog here with you. Oh, it's the same. It's the same seed catalog. I've just been marking it up. It's. It, I don't really have anything new. Well, are, are there some uh, things you've found that you're excited about ordering? Um, other than the corn, let me see. I, I think there's um, not the peppers. I want to get ground cherries again. They have two kinds this year. Ground yeah. cherries were really fun. Yeah, the, the children loved them, but didn't like eating them nearly as much as I did. Yeah, we got them so the kids would just eat them. Uh, when they were out playing, they would just like pull them off the vine and eat Stack. them. And I like to pull them off the vine. Uh, and throw them at each other. <laughs> <laughs> but and the nice, drop them everywhere. Drop them everywhere. The nice <laughs> thing about ground cherries, though, is that those become new plants. Well, yeah, but we don't want them everywhere. <laughs> everywhere, all the time. Now, there's a uh, there's Aunt Molly's uh, ground cherry, which a lot of people maybe know about. There's also the Lowen family heirloom, which is slightly different, a little bigger, a little juicier. The ones we had before were a, a very pretty sort of pale yellow in the little paper wrappers. Yeah, yeah, they look like they're like Chinese lanterns, but yeah. edible. Um, and then I told and you, I told you guys about the, the they, blue corn. They were great as a little supplement for something. Like well, you wouldn't eat a pile of them, but you would throw them in a. You would throw a few into a salad. salad. Yeah, I really, actually, I really liked them. And salad. then as you were eating the salad, you come across these little flavor explosions that were very pleasant to eat. Oh, a little sweet one. Ooh, another sweet one. Yeah, I, I mentioned I already mentioned the black Aztec corn and the blue jade corn. One's a sweet corn. I think that's blue jade. Is that right? My glasses, I need to take Because <laughs> this, it's, I'm, I'm there, I'm We're, at that you're point. You're there. Uh, oh, yeah, you had a birthday. Oh, do you have to bring that up? Sorry, that keeps happening. Keeps happening. Oh, it's, yeah, the Blue Jay is a sweet corn, and the Black Aztec is a flint corn, which uh, Veronica and I are going to grind and make tamales out of. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. So that's the plan with the corn, and then there's ground cherries. I think that may be it. I just started some strawberries. Okay. Which I already, which I had. Yeah. Um, that's that's I'm growing greens and um, some berries. I'd like to plant a bunch of trees, frankly, but um, I'm not sure where I'm going to get trees from yet. Yeah, we don't really have a big budget for the garden this year either. No, so. we don't. So, but you know, it's okay. We'll make it. Yeah. So okay. So that's where I'm at. Uh, do we? Uh, oh, we take a little sponsor break. Oh yeah, we have a sponsor. That's right. Yeah, okay. Here so go. I've got a I've got some some wording from our sponsor here. Even an alpha male can have an off day. A female may admire your thick, luxurious coat from a distance, but uh it's a different story when she gets up close if it's dry, thinning and flaky. They're going to run into the forest howling. <laughs> That's why there's silver bra- silver <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's why there's Silverback brand back hair conditioner. Just rub in a little Silverback after you've shampooed your back, and that back hair will come out shiny, smooth, and luxurious without that annoying back dandruff. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's also guaranteed to kill lice on contact, so your maid doesn't need to spend her evenings picking off parasites. And, <laughs> and it has a fresh eucalyptus scent. <laughs> that sounds like a great sponsor. Have they been <laughs> with us longer? No, <laughs> brand new. Brand new. Um, that's right. Ask for it by name, Silverback brand back hair conditioner, available wherever fine hair care products are sold. Wow, I'll be looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did you want to mention the uh, the candle mass? Oh, yeah. Yeah, mention the candle mass before we... So candle mass is a um, uh, traditional Catholic feast. And it's been around for a long time. Many sort of um, tradie, tra- traditional leaning Catholics celebrate it as the end of Christmas. Yeah. Christmas actually ended weeks ago on the liturgical calendar and always has. <laughs> but um, a lot of people keep their lights up and, you know, do small yeah. sacrifices for Christmas until February 2nd. 
Okay. Which is can, which this is the feast of the presentation of Jesus at the temple. It's so like forty days after Jesus was born, the, his parents Joseph and Mary. He developed really fast. <laughs> That's not that not that the temple. He's brought, they brought him as a baby. To the oh, temple. not where he shows up and starts arguing no. with all the scholars. No, that's later. Oh, okay. Um, so th- this feast, Candlemas, is um, you like you bring um, any statues of Jesus you might have? Yeah. So um, this yeah, so it was a Spanish mass, and of course the people attending were mostly Hispanic. Mostly Hispanic. And, and a number of people brought these these very cool little little statues of statues yeah. of, of the infant Jesus. Yeah. Uh, it's a popular. It's still celebrated uh, <clears throat> widely throughout Latin America. Yeah, it was pretty cool to see, and they. They did a blessing, for blessing them. for all the all the, all the statues. statues, and yeah. for your and for your, you can bring your candles too if you have to holy be candles. Blessed. Yeah. To be blessed for your home, and uh, there was a, a Spanish mass, mm-hmm. which um, I always appreciate because it sort of allows me to experience life as an Hispanic Catholic in the United States. Yeah, you were uh, you know commenting that our inability to understand the, the mass. Right. was largely the experience that a that a Hispanic Catholic would have had for decades in trying, most parishes in the United in States. most parishes trying to attend mass and being able to understand only a fraction of what was right. being like said like some little pieces of it here and there which from my part I know everyone thinks I'm um just an old funny daddy yeah. is why I strongly advocate for saying the mass in Latin uh, because if you grow up and learn the Mass in Latin... Because no one understands it then. <laughs> no, because then everyone understands it. If all Catholics say the Mass in Latin... If all Catholics learn the Mass in Latin. Then but anywhere you go, wherever you go... When you go to a Latin Mass, is the homily in Latin too? No, that's Latin right. Or like what now... That's Tridentine right. The, that's masses. where they really do everything in Latin. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I mean... Okay. So I, I have to say, years and years ago, I had... Uh, a lot of Spanish in high school and mm-hmm. a lot of Spanish in college. Um, I could understand Spanish moderately well. I wasn't great at speaking it. I wasn't fluent. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, especially not a native speaker at high speed, at full speed, right. you know. But um, I could read Spanish pretty well. But uh, going to this thing, I, I realized it's been a, that was a long, long time, time ago. ago. And I could understand next to nothing. Right. I could understand words and phrases. Um, the priest gave some kind of a little anecdote at the end, like right, right before everyone um, left for the mm-hmm. Pollock dinner right. afterwards. Right, there was dinner afterwards. Um, and it sounded to me like he was telling a little anecdote and people were laughing at it. And I think it had something to do with a like a family reunion and a dog that was running around licking everybody. <laughs> but I could be completely wrong about yeah, what it was yeah. about. <laughs> it could have been about any number of things, and yeah, yeah. Um, I may have I may have misunderstood completely. completely. I didn't even get that much. Right? Yeah, uh, from, from the I, mean, I I understood the mass part, but that yeah. was it. I you know I yeah I understood the mass parts, and I there were a few phrases like um, "palabra," you know, is is word. So I was mm-hmm. talking to Josh, kind of muttering to Josh about. It how that meant word of God, word you know, God, right. and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. so much I didn't didn't, get. didn't unpack. Yeah. And yeah, the homily was entirely Not in Spanish. Spanish. So, so it was billed as a bilingual mass, but actually only a few phrases were ever in English. English. Yeah. Well, a lot of times we describe masses as being bilingual, <clears throat> and there's a few phrases in Spanish. Right, right. And almost all the masses in yeah. English. Yeah, almost the only things that were said in English were the intentions, and yes. the intentions were bilingual. The person reading the intentions would say them both in Spanish and English. English. But that, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, I found it very gratifying in that respect to to uh, empathize. Kids were kind of bored out of their skulls. <laughs> That's actually why I let Bill behold his lit candle for so long. Yeah, because okay. I knew it was going to be a long haul for him. Uh, but he, he did. I only had to leave once with him. He did pretty well. Yeah, he and, did pretty well. Yeah, there was dinner afterwards. There was a lovely potluck dinner yeah. afterwards, and the they tamales. were serving six different kinds of tamales. Oh, I good. had to really work hard to restrain myself, and I only, I only tried three of the types. I only ate like two and a half tamales. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and there was a good, like, a fruit bar. 
Yeah. And uh, about all these pastries. All these. Uh, yeah. What are those pastries? The, the those little round pastries. They had them cut in half. Yeah, you know I don't know what they're called. They're round pastries, and they're like painted with this like dusty like, stuff. Yeah, it's it's not, it's like it's not powdered it's, sugar. It's like colored powdered sugar, but thicker and yeah, kind of like a cross between icing and powdered sugar. Yeah, I don't. I honestly don't know what it is. They're very tasty. Yes, Veronica loved them. Yeah, it's like there's one left. We have to make this. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to get the last one, Mom. Right. I, I they they must have a name. They also had. Uh, hot chocolate and yeah. some of the uh, some of like some sweet rolls that were like uh, dulce de leche flavored, like mm-hmm. car- caramel flavored, that were pretty yummy, really good. So yeah, of course the kids filled up their plates with M and M's, M and M's, and and um, and these soda. pastries. Well, yeah, the pastries and soda. Yeah, and I was desperately trying to. How about food, guys? What do you think about food? food. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, but it know. but it, it was, was nice. It was nice. Yeah. It was. It's always fun to see kids running around in the PAC. Yes, yeah, that's always a pleasure. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was Candlemas. And was there? Was there? I feel like there was something else. Oh, I didn't. I didn't try any of the chocolate because it all had milk in it. And I was. You, 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 yeah. You've been reacting a lot to milk lately. You've been avoiding it. Yeah, I've been avoiding it largely. But man, yeah. it smelled great. Yeah, it really smelled good. It was pretty good. All right. Yeah. So, so we we are not really well organized tonight. Are but we ever? <laughs> we have been. Yeah, well, I have had some, entirely written out pieces to read. That's true. And um, we've 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 had some episodes where we just notes. like clicked though. Yeah. Even though we weren't, you know, really yeah. super prepped. But we've got a couple of we've, topics. We've got a couple topics. Uh, we're going to return to um, um, just talk. I guess I used as a jumping off point last week's essay. From the weeds about their divorce, yes. And um, then we've got another piece uh, for all of our sci-fi fans, and um, and beyond, and beyond. <laughs> okay, so the weeds, if you recall, uh, uh, Latter Day Saint couple mm-hmm. who uh, where the the man, uh, what was that? Ten years ago? It was just five years ago. They'd been married ten years, five years. Okay, ago. five years ago, the man. Uh, came out publicly as as a gay man, and um, and they came out as a couple, as a married couple. They came out as a married couple that was going to try to stay together as a married couple and live as a a married couple, a, a mixed marriage, mixed orientation, a, a mixed orientation marriage. And that was a new phrase to me at the time. I mean, you know, it's not a new thing. Of course, this happens all the time. Sure, but I mean to be like open and vocal about it right was seemed Unusual. like a bit of a new thing to me especially yeah. in the lds community, community. yeah yeah so uh, and then uh, last time we talked about how they had announced that they were divorcing yeah and you read the whole 15 page <laughs> i read the whole 15 page essay and we which we hadn't really finished for last time, and so you had some further thoughts. Uh, yeah, um, and and I, I noticed then, and I think I mentioned it last week that um, I was a little curious about the way she was talking about romance and how critical it was for a healthy marriage, and how she seemed to be talking about something that was not sexual but romantic, but was critical for a healthy marriage. She was writing about. Um, uh, passion in their marriage and how like it, she wasn't didn't feel she needed to leave her husband because of like a uh, lack of sex and right. the fact that he could no longer uh, like perform heterosexual intercourse with her right uh but it was about but it was about not looking at her with sm- smoldering passion in his eyes and desiring her and desiring her and Grace and I were looking at each other, kind of saying, "Well, that's not going to be there if you're not doing the sex thing." That's like uh, it's like they were speaking a, a language that uh, they were claiming has extra words in it that we've never found actually any use for, right? Or that have any meaning, right? And and also, 
I guess what really bothered me about it was a it sounded like she was talking about this this in between thing, right? Yes. Where I'm well acquainted with sexual romance. Yes. And I'm well acquainted with platonic romance. Yes. And she's talking about some third other thing. Yes. And and then this is the part that got to me, claiming that it's a universal need. Right. That you got to have this. Right. You just got to have this. And I think it's entirely fair and appropriate and good and right for her to claim that for herself and say that I need this. I need but this. But we were even, yeah, I, that's fair. But I think we were also still having a hard time trying to pin down exactly what that was. What even this thing is. And I, I made some notes here. This is from um, Sojourner Magazine. Mm-hmm. This is an article I'll put in the show notes that talks about the the traditional um, the uh, Greek words for different kinds of love yes. that have sort of endured over the centuries. Endured and animated our thinking about. As concepts. Like right. we're, we're familiar with eros mm-hmm. and agape. Okay. And but philia. The, but there are a few more. So mm-hmm. eros is sexual passion or desire. And it's considered um, fiery and dangerous, you the know. Hots. Yeah. It can break up marriages <laughs> yeah, and yeah. destroy communities. <laughs> and, Just uh, burn the village, you know. Yeah. That's arrows. Um, philia, uh, deep friendship that in ancient times developed between comrades who fought together on the battlefield. And that has to do with loyalty and sacrifice, shared experience, and sharing emotions. Yeah. Right. There's a then there's agape, which is love for everyone. This is considered the highest love, a caritas or charity, Mm -hmm. also translated. It's considered the highest form of Christian love. It's also embodies empathy for strangers. Right. Empathy for all living things. All living things. Um, It's like the like the love that God has for all. Yeah. Yeah. That. That's a god. So it's it's considered the most godlike. The, the, when you're experiencing agape love, you're cl- closest to how God loves the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ludus, which is, um, I didn't even know this was considered a form of love, but they describe Ludus as playful love um, between young lovers and and children. Uh, or teasing, flirting, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Very flirtatious, um, like often unconsummated flirtation. Oh, right, right. And the article describes it as like if you go out and spend the evening dancing with strangers at a bar, that oh, can be kind of this be, ludus. Right. And uh, if there's no expectation, you're actually going to go home with any of them. So, right, right. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one called pragma or pragma. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not pragmatic, is it? Pragmatic, long-standing love in married couples. Uh, quote, standing in love. Unquote. It's about compromises, patience, and tolerance. Basically, doing what it takes to be together and support each other for the long haul. That's what I'm talking it's about. Sort of a less passionate mm-hmm. form of love, and then one called philosia, um, hmm. self-love. And two varieties, there's narcissism, which is considered (laughs) negative. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then there's also a form of loving yourself that's considered more positive. Uh, I, when reading the description, I think of it as self-respect. Right. Self-respect and self-understanding that then allows you to to meet your own needs and and then go forth and love other people. Right. You know. Which which is really quite healthy. Yeah. And important. So... I'm of these six, what the hell is she talking about? I don't know. It, now it seems to me you mentioned like Disney love, right? The the way she described it to me, I heard like the sort of Prince Charming Disney, right? Ro- romantic love, and to me, thing. that is like what you might call a crush mm-hmm. or being in love with love. Yeah. Or or being in love with an ideal yeah. instead of a person, and yeah. and it always seemed to me that I mean I've been there when I had crushes, you mm-hmm. know, when I was quite young. But that always seemed like something you would grow out of. Yeah, well, and and this is the other element to it. So I mentioned how it seemed a little weird to me that 
like, yeah, I don't know what this is. But also, there's this element which is, well, no, this isn't a sexual thing. Right. And then she describes the sexy stuff. Right. Like, passion, you know, looking with passion, desiring, wanting. Uh, and I don't understand exactly what she's talking about and, or why it would be a bad thing to acknowledge that as sexual. Uh, yeah, that, 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 yeah it's, I'd, like, I'd like a sexual romance. Right. It's not a bad thing to like or want or be interested in finding. But she says repeatedly that this is not a sexual thing. It's not about the sex. I, I just don't quite so, I don't know. understand it. The other thing that you, you you mentioned that I just had to laugh about oh, yeah. is that I didn't realize that both of them were apparently counselors. They were both marriage and family, family counselors, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and... I'm not going to offer any further comment yeah. on that. Um, anyway. It that, seems like an unusual uh, thing. It seems like they've, they're have they just spinning as fast as they can to talk themselves into trying to keep their marriage together in a way that they can live with. Yeah. Um, oh, I sh- yeah, I should also give the summary because you hadn't finished reading it. I didn't yeah. read the whole thing. Yeah. And what it sounds like, and I remember... Last week we were talking about how it, it's it always feels like a death to us when a marriage ends. Yes. Um, that yeah, has yeah. that aspect. It, it has that it. has that that uh, dimension to it. Yeah. And uh, death of possibility and so many other things. But all that aside, right? Um, it doesn't actually sound to me like they're ending their marriage. It sounds like they're going to stop having sex with each other. Yeah, or trying to. <laughs> right. It, you know, it, like it's, it sounds like he's not interested in that anymore full yeah, stop yeah and the, and she's not going to force him so right. it sounds like that they're ending the sexual part of their marriage and it sounds like they're ending the legal part of their marriage yeah and nothing else about their marriage is going to change they're uh, going to continue to live together to raise their children together they're just not going to date other people. other people well didn't you say they were going to have other people live in their house with them well they said that ultimately their <sighs> hope is that they would have a home together with yeah. their children, and they'd welcome partners to that home, like a place for all of them to live. Yeah, and and let me be more, be be more specific. Okay. They're imagining this as a homestead, so maybe like two separate buildings. I see. But you know, and they each live in their own building, or you know, <laughs> it's it's not a, it's not clear. It doesn't exist yet. Yeah. But that's the idea. They'd be one household, regardless of you know, and where who sleeps where is another story. But they're one household. I just, you know, having. I kind of followed a bit about the poly community when that was becoming a thing online. Yeah. there Way back when there were news groups, there was a thing called Alt Polyamory, mm-hmm. which was a place where the subculture of polyamorous folks worked itself out and developed into a culture. Yes. With its own sort of set of internal rules and logic. And I always... It was never, you know, I was never really interested in that as being my thing, but it was interesting to me to see it kind of work out as a lurker Mm -hmm. and to see them develop sort of a set of principles and rules and, and norms as to how a household like that might function. Right. And, um, I don't think these folks are being honest enough with themselves about their own needs or mature enough to actually walk open-eyed into a poly (laughs) household. And they're not even calling it that. Right. They're not calling it that. Right. Because it takes particular people who are not deeply jealous people Mm-hmm. who are mature and stable and and most important i think very self reflective mm. and have mm-hmm. the ability to watch their own emotional state and get meet their own emotional needs and not just suppress things until they blow up yeah i i actually i think it's much more cultural than that that there are cultures yeah. In which uh, either uh, polyandry or poly, yes. uh, polygamy are... Polygamy or... So, 
our, our, our norm, well, our cultural norm, support it culturally and socially, and has all these sort of like what, what I like to call soft supports. Yes. You don't even realize they're there. Yeah, right, right. Um, and you don't need any kind of like special person to do that. It's just what's done. Well, you know, I, I think if you're going to voluntarily enter a polyamorous community in the United States, whatever in the United States, um, you should have that cultural backing. Yes. You should, but you also should be self-aware enough to know whether this is going to be right for you emotionally, whether it's actually going to work. It'll be good for you. And right. you shouldn't just be doing it because it represents some kind of ideal that you aspire to. Right. Well, and I th I think I, I, want to I want to just be very clear. They are not describing this for themselves as, as, as a polyamory. Exactly. They, that's not how they self-describe. That's not how they self-identify. Self yes. They're getting a divorce and they're finding other partners and they're going to live in the same household. Well, okay. Now, somehow, yeah. I, I, and I me, feel that like, feel, it seems like it, they're hoping for a, they don't, the thing is that that's, that's like an immature view of, of polyamory, yeah. which is you want to be able to break up without losing anything. Yeah. Right. That's sort of like a, that's, to me, that's like the childish view of us. Yeah, you can you can like uh, date everyone and you never have to break up, right? Yeah, it's okay. Because no, you like, just switch from, you know, one, one sort of primary part, you know, partner to another. I, th there's, I think there's, that's kind of insulting to that community and there's actually a lot more to it than that, you know. And I, I also think they have some taboos around um, polyamory yes. Obvious folks. I mean, I've got yeah. some taboos around polyamory, right? But but, it, but the yeah, no, like, I think that's that's I think that's the reason they can't call it what it is. Or what they they're can't to call do. it what it is, but it's also because yeah of the tradition of of um, polygamy in um, their culture. It makes more sense to them to lean towards this than than some other arrangement. Some other arrangement, right? So I I don't know. The more I think about it, the more I just think this is just not. You know, you kind of scratching your head, but you know they. The thing that really came through for me, I, I, want, I want to end my conversation about them yeah. on uh, on a mostly positive note because I think it, I think writ large, it it mostly is positive. There, there's a few like things that don't make sense to me and seem quirky that I don't, I just yeah, flatly don't understand. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean to be clear, I I wish them all the best in the world. I hope they can make their lives work out and be very positive for themselves but and their children and and their children but right. i just really like you say i'm scratching my head as to how this is going to get them there well yeah um i think the way i was i described it with one of my friends this week that i was reflecting on this with um the two of them are clearly best friends with each other yeah to have gone through all this yeah they're, they're very close they're yes um they've been best friends i think since high school sure um and care deeply for each other, and clearly love each other very much, and love the children they share very much. And um, that's not trivial. That's not trivial at all. No, and it's not something that, um, you know, I'm not advocating that they throw it away in some sense. Right, yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't think they should either. And I, I don't know what they should do. I'm not them, I'm not there. But um, <coughs> I think they have the tools to get to where they need to go. I'm, like I said, scratching my head a little bit, but I think they'll get somewhere, and I think um, everyone will be loved and cared for in the process. I am not so um, optimistic. Yeah. Because I think uh, to get to where they are are hoping to get to, they. I don't think they can go there with the cultural toolkit that they're carrying around in their heads. And the, oh. the biggest piece of that cultural toolkit is, for them, it sounds like, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Latter Saints. Saints. Yeah, yeah. Because right. they, they, they want to uh, assume, that, thinking about something he said about, um, uh, you know, there's certain things you can't choose about your life and yourself. Right. Yes. Which you know, I'm I'm all there for that. There are things that you can't choose. Um, and he says, but he can choose to continue to be a member of the LDS Church. He can continue to, um, 
live his life with his family and and so on. It's clear from their it's kind of impassioned writing in both both their famous blog posts mm -hmm. that that um this is very the church is very very important. To it's them, absolutely both critical of them. to them. It's central to them. And um and I think they're um finding a path or trying to forge a path as loyal opposition. There are many Catholics like this. Uh -huh. who um agitate fervently for say women's ordination or, or any number of things in the Catholic Church. Okay. And they go to mass every week, they're committed, they're on, like on the altar society, they're there. They're there for it. And they are very committed Catholics who understand themselves as loyal opposition who want to make a prophetic call to the church to do things differently. Uh huh. And I think they're they're trying to forge a path like that for themselves. And I don't know the interior landscape of the LDS. Yeah. There may be others within the church structure to welcome them and support them. Maybe. Because okay. I, I think <clears throat> if there is that, because there's, there's all these structures, there's like... They're, they're not going to more Mexit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there'll be any more Mexit. Did you just say that? More Mexit? <laughs> well, I was thinking of dumb exit, like how... You know, people's like, Leave well, if you're a leftist, you should be fighting to move the Democratic Party to the left. And like, mm. oh, I'm a Demexeter at this Demexeter point. Demexeter, leaving. Um, <coughs> I never joined, but that's right. another story for another day. No, I think there's, that, like, uh, there, there, uh, so there's America Magazine in the Catholic Senate, and then there's this, this Commonweal. America is specifically Jesuit. It's a Jesuit Catholic yes. magazine, and people describe it as leftist or communist or I don't know what, but, <laughs> but they're actually pretty... I've never thought of it that way. I yeah, no, say. it's it's really just kind of like white bread American Catholicism. Yes. It's, it's not anything more radical than that. Commonweal, on the other hand, is like where the loyal opposition goes to read. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then there are these instead sort of, of going to mass. <laughs> no, they go to mass. These people go to mass. Okay, all right. Because you know they, they're not gonna. Basically, they're not giving up the church. No one's gonna take the yeah. church from them. They're gonna no stay. No one's gonna take the church from them. Right. right. So okay. they. So like that contingent in Catholicism has their own magazines. They know how to find each other. They you know, um, the peace and justice committee is where they like to lurk at church. Just if you're looking for these folks, yeah, maybe at your yeah, local Catholic church. Yeah. There must um, be a peace and justice committee. There's a peace and justice committee. That's where you'll find them. Or like if you see, if you're looking online, you know, trying to find a church. Um, there's no loyal opposition, loyal opposition at that parish. If there's no peace and justice committee. Mm hmm. So, yeah, just good, keep. good to know. Yeah, little tips here. It's kind of like when you go to a new a new town and you go to the health food store and you look at the bulletin board and yes. you find out all the all the stuff going on. It's yeah. like that. Yeah, so yeah. there may be some equivalent in the LDS Church where there's like a little coffee club mm -hmm. of loyal opposition, and there's a place where they can go so they can remain in the LDS Church and still get the community that nourishes you. I I really can't say. It seems like That's what I can't say. It seems like a very oppressive um, paternal organization to me. Hey. But, but but you know what? Just like I used to lurk on um, alt polyamory yeah. because I was intrigued by this culture. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I knew it was not going to be no, not you for know, you, but yeah. right for me. Um, I I lurk on the ex Mormon Reddit's. Sometimes. Oh, the ex-Mormon right? And they're it? fascinating, yeah, I have yeah. to say. There's a lot of people. A lot of ex-Mormons. Yeah, talking. Yeah. Talking trash. <laughs> Not trash. Yeah. They're, many of them are still deeply faithful. Yes, yes. That's sort of kind of part of what, you know, just like I admire in some sense what the, the polyamory folks were trying to do. Mm-hmm. I really admire people who are still faithful, but uh, but are like you say loyal opposition. Loyal opposition can't that, don't have a space there anymore. That so. kind of fascinates me. The people who are clearly so, um, you know, have so much faith in the the in the church they were brought up with that they can't just sh shut it off. They can't shut it off. They can't walk away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah. Religious tradition becomes part of you. Yeah, it literally becomes a part of you, and. Um, so I, I think there's very possibly, I think it's more likely that they will have a showdown with the LDS Church than they will with their family. Yeah, yeah uh, that's I think, probably true. Yeah. Yeah. But that, so I, I don't know how that's going to work out in the end, and I, do, you know, I don't want to predict or anything. And I do wish them all the best. I, I just, 
I'm still scratching my head a little bit. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah, there's more. There's more. Picard and Dathan at Eladrell. So, um, yeah, this was... Oh, well, we've been watching, uh, well, rewatching for the most part, episodes of Star Trek: The Next Generation. Mm-hmm. This is the thing about being a parent: is um, if there's media that you grew up with or that you admire from, you know, even, either your childhood or your young, your young adulthood. In this case, it would be my young adulthood. Mm-hmm. Um, you get a chance to share it with your kids, and then you experience it all over again. Yay! In so, one of my favorite episodes of star trek the next generation and i remember vividly watching it with some friends of mine Mm -hmm. uh, a a year or two after i moved to ann arbor uh, i had to get together with some co-workers to watch star trek um this is an episode yeah (laughs) this is an episode called darmok Mm -hmm. and um i'm not going to really summarize the whole thing uh, it's pretty famous it's pretty famous and the summary's a bit involved Summary's a bit involved. Um, Picard is having first contact with an alien race. The sh- and, yeah, they've been previously thought to be unintelligible. No one can understand what they're saying. Right. Because they they just speak in these phrases that don't have any meaning to the people coming to, to, to visit them. Right. And um, they the anyway, the crew of the Enterprise finally determines that what these people are saying are basically stock phrases or allegorical phrases from their myths and legends. Right. So oh, like even not, not even like phrases necessarily, but like like really short references. little summaries, references. Yeah. Like so and so in that thing. You know? So even what to call this kind of communication is kind of is disputed. And it's a good open question. Um in the show they refer to it as Metaphor. Uh, metaphor. Uh, you also might think of some of it as tropes, like it, TV tropes. I think she, uh, uh, Council Troy refers to it as imagery or images. Imagery, right. yeah. Um, you might call them allegories. Yep. Or, um, or you might call them memes if you're into internet yeah. culture now. Uh, yeah, I'd call it a meme, really. So, so an, an example of the story, a real quick version of the story, is that in one of these planets past there were two folks they arrived they sailed across the sea and they arrived on an island they arrived separately separately. so it's darmok on the ocean Mm -hmm. and then uh jalad on on the the ocean ocean. darmok and jalad at at tanagra which is the island and then the beast at tanagra there's some kind of a horrible monster on the island right and then Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra fight the beast. They defeat the beast. And then Darmok and Jalad, Jalad on the, the ocean. ocean. They leave together. They leave together. Right. So that's a capsule summary of something that might in its fullness look like. What's, what's the, the story? Gil, the story of Gilgamesh. Epic of Gilgamesh. Epic of, Epic of Gilgamesh. Right. Or like um, uh, Be- Beowulf. Beowulf or, yeah. or, or a Greek. You know, a Greek, Greek myth. myth. Like, so it's a full story, right? Yeah. But you can reference, so, you know, they went to the island together. Right. Right? Or, you know, yeah. they left the island together. Yeah, Penelope and Hades or Penelope whatever. Penelope and Hades, you know? yeah. yeah. So, um, so uh, when Picard meets the captain... Uh, of, the other, of the alien vessel. They're talking over their view screens, mm-hmm. and this alien captain, uh, Dathan is arguing with his first officer. Yeah, right. They're trying to figure out what to do. And the, the captain keeps saying, no, Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. And the, the, the first officer's like, no, don't do that. Don't and the captain that. insists. And then they steal Picard. Picard Good. is dematerialized Good. via transporter by the alien ship from the bridge and sent down to the surface of this planet with, with the captain. With the other captain. With the other captain. And then this alien ship, they they turn on some kind of scrambling field so that the Enterprise can't use its transporters. So they can't send anyone down. They can't communicate. Oh, Joshua is bringing the baby down. Oh, baby. Baby girl. So I'll keep talking. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can get her to nurse. Something like that. Something like that. I think that's why she's here. That's why she's here. Oh, it clearly is. Anyway, so... Um, Picard and the and the captain are now on this planet's surface, and 
um, the captain, uh, Dathan, keeps offering Picard a knife, and he thinks Picard that, thinks Picard thinks that this means that Dathan wants to challenge him to a battle, challenge him to a duel or some kind of. And he's not into that. He keeps dropping the knife and saying, "I'm not going to fight you." And Dathan is like oh, rolling his eyes, like, "Come on, why can't he understand?" And then this monster shows no. up. And uh, Picard eventually realizes that he has to pick up the the knife. The knife is for me to fight the monster. And they have to fight together because this monster is too big for either one of them them. to defeat alone. Right. And so then they talk strategy using more metaphors, allegorical Mm -hmm. phrases from... From their past. From their past and all this. And they eventually figure out how to communicate. However... Dathan is badly injured in the fight. In the fight, while the Enterprise is trying to beam up Picard, he can't fight for a few minutes. A couple critical moments, and Dathan um, is badly injured, right. and he can't help. And then um, Dathan eventually dies. Mm-hmm. So, but, but the sacrifice he made. The sacrifice he made meant that Picard now could speak to the people on this ship. Right. They've made first contact. Right. And so their legend... Now includes... Now includes uh, Picard and Dathan at El Yeah. Right. right. So this is all about, to me, how our, our shared stories allow us to communicate with each other. Right. Yeah, that you can't communicate with someone that doesn't share your stories. And so, you know, I've read... Greek myths. I'm reading the kids Norse myths. I grew up with these myths. I grew up with mm-hmm. the Bible. You know, not just a little Bible, but a lot of a lot of, a lot the, of Bible, the Bible, a lot of Bible study. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Beowulf, you know, and the Tolkien, yeah. and, and you know everything. It all feeds into the hopper. Right. And having lived together and read together and spoken together for so many years, Grace and I have a huge. Shared repository of repository stories. Repository of stories that we can mm-hmm. reference, uh, even to make dumb jokes. Yeah. About, that's kind of dumb jokes. About gorilla back hair conditioner. <laughs> 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 or whatever. Yeah, whatever it might be. So I'm getting somewhere with this, which is that, um, you know, it used to be only, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, when most people watch broadcast TV. Mm-hmm. You know how many people tuned in to watch the last episode of MASH? Oh, yeah. I did. It was a huge thing. It's huge. Right. And most Americans shared that experience, experience of watching that. Yeah. I don't know about most, but... A lot of Americans. A lot of Americans. A lot of uh, culturally similar Americans yes. shared that experience. Right. So, if you could say... Hawkeye on the bus yeah. in Korea. Yeah. People are like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, and really, you have a shorthand now. Yes. For communicating a lot of information. Yes. Almost like instantaneously. Like you bring that image and the experience of the image to mind. Right. Just by triggering... The emotional content, too. All the emotional content is right there by recalling that shared experience. Yes. That so, shared story. So we're now in this... Sea of narratives. Yeah. But uh, we're not sharing them. No, we're not. No, the, the and we're, all in, we're, we're in silos. We're all in our little tin cans these watching narrative silos. one narrative. It's the associative um, mating of people, you know, into yeah. their little silos where like, oh, well, we were watching Game of Thrones. Oh, we're, we were watching House of Cards. Oh, we were, we're watching, watching this other thing. Right. Oh, you know, we well, were watching Fox News. Well, and, and you kind of like, it's it's self-feeding. Like you ask the people in your silo, so what are you watching? Yes. And they tell you what and they're then watching. You go watch and then it. you go watch it. Yeah, assortative mating, so, you know, self-selection. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so um, there are a lot of factors here. One of the big ones is the decline of broadcast television yeah right well and and frankly the complete breakdown of any kind of um um, shared knowledge base among americans knowledge and even uh even religious education yeah it's all broken and And then that also was accelerated by the demolition of the fairness doctrine 
yes. in uh, under the Reagan administration, where news outlets don't feel obligated to uh, avoid the appearance of bias. Right. They have no obligation to that. And um, say whatever they want to pander to their base that pays for the advertising. Yeah. And so even older and more reputable and venerable media sources basically now have this tendency, and here's where I'm going with this, yeah. to turn themselves into stenographers. Oh, right. So there's an article that appeared in BBC, mm-hmm. BBC News. The Paul Simon city that turned to Trump. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw that one. This is about Saginaw. Mm-hmm. So this is the thing. The New York Times now interviews Nazis because, well, they're important. Their point of view is important to share with the world, right? Right. And um, not just have thoughts too, you know. And the BBC now sends correspondents to Rust Belt cities in the middle of Michigan to ask everyone what they think. So what do you think? Well, which, frankly, as someone who used to live there, I always thought they should come find out what people there think and how the world should be from folks that are places that are forgotten and overlooked. But um, I'm not quite sure that's what they were doing. This at, least, is, at least not the spirit that I was thinking, imagining it. It's a strange article because it's just sort of a profile. But it seems to me that in the course of profiling you would contextualize? these folks, you would contextualize it. So there is some context given. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's sort of broken up into two groups of people. There's the Trump supporters and the Democrats. They quote people mm-hmm. from both groups right but there's no uh they don't interact right oh, and the right. correspondent doesn't interact no they one's pushing asked. back they're just it's it's they're i guess this counts they think this counts as balance well, let's balance talk to fairness. some democrats too right but it's just stenography there's no um there's no dialogue. There's no debate. There's no context setting about the ideas that they're... And I think that's the important, that there's no context setting about the ideas because journalists typically are people who are making a journal entry of what they see. That's... Right? But they also give context and frame what they see because yeah. you have to. Yeah. You can't present this as if it's... You can't present an editorial like a news feature. Right. So this is like this... I want to read a little bit. So they just interview people, and then it's very telegraphic. They have a few paragraphs about each person, Mm -hmm. very short paragraphs. Daryl Wimbley knows he's not a typical Trump supporter. The 49-year-old was born in Alabama to a black mother and Arab father. Growing up, his father spoke to him only in Arabic. At the age of three, he moved to Saginaw with his mother. And then I I skip ahead a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just want to point out his... That probably means his father was an immigrant, right? So, yeah, yeah. But skipping down a few lines. After Obama, uh, I didn't care. What, oh, he says the most racist thing he ever did was voted for voting for Obama. I didn't care what his views were. I didn't care. He was black, and that was it. I didn't question it. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, that's not just him, but yes. It's not just him, but it's, it's also not really racist but anyway it's it's a different sort of meaning of racist well yeah, it's, um, it's a kind of bigotry but racial on. racial solidarity over over uh, any other concern i guess mm-hmm. after obama came to office he did question it voting republican for the first time in 2012 mm-hmm. and when donald trump became a candidate he listened he said a lot of things that i thought but would never say in public he says such as Illegal immigrants do cause a lot of crime, he replied. <laughs> hmm. uh, I'm not going to keep going, but then there's a, there's a second person, Jim Hines. Jim Hines, a Christian, is not put off by the president's crudeness. It's not how I would express myself, but I think he speaks from the heart or his tough line on immigration. To have a sovereign country, you need borders, he said. Immigration, great, but not illegal immigration. He supports the wall on the Mexican border and thinks Mr. Trump's policies, especially the tax cuts, have rejuvenated Saginaw. Fascinating. I haven't been been in like a month or two. Maybe I should go back. (coughs) Saginaw has lost half its population since 1960. Yeah. Uh, Something that Saginaw could benefit enormously from 
would be a huge wave of immigration. <laughs> Actually, to be perfectly honest. Sue Lin, 63, also admires the president, but her language is more colorful, more Trump-like. Quote, if you've got an infestation of rats, you call the guy to come in, she says. Quote, you don't care if his crack's showing, you don't care if he's swearing, you don't care if he's got tobacco-stained teeth. You want the rats taken out. Well, there you go. So, um, yeah. So I guess they're setting the context and saying you know, she's definitely a little more colorful in her language. But I'd just like to point out that the BBC... Has this woman referring to human beings as rats? Has, has given over... It's microphone. It's microphone, it's online presence to this woman from Saginaw who refers to immigrants as rats. Yeah. As vermin. I, I'm not really comfortable with that. And honestly, I'm not sure what benefit is served by giving Trump supporters more of a platform to anti-virtue signal each other. Yeah. No, there's... The, the only benefit is to help them find each other and help them find their story and find out how to communicate with each other and how so, to signal each other. So about those stories, I mean, the stories, the memes, and whatnot, you know... Mm -hmm. um, it, the, I, I left a lot of this out. It's a, you know, it's quite a long article. It's a long article. So like he, this. And frankly, uh, the, I think a lot of it we don't want to. We don't want to, to share. share, right? But you know, the guy was talking about the same things that Trump was talking about in his State of the Union address. He was talking about um, criminal gangs of immigrants. You know, right. by referring to these Central American gangs. You know, he talks about this. He talks about criminality. These are the stories that they're sharing. Well, it's like right? the welfare queen story. This it's like the welfare queen story. These this is their common language that they have to draw on, and then refer to in shorthand. Yes. Right. So, like the rats, you know, the mm -hmm. rat catcher. You know, she's really referring to like ice, ice, right? Yeah. But I'm people like me have positive stories in our heads about immigration immigrants and immigration and would point out that the guy who's first quoted his father was an immigrant he shouldn't feel that he's in a position to attack immigrants but his father came here legally <sighs> that's the retort yeah you know i talking about me about that a lot of people say that my, you know, my ancestors came, came here, here legally. legally. You go back far That's enough, and heart. there was no legal. There's no legal about it. There was no legal about it. There was no authority to when, say you can when or can't people come. were just showing up. First of all, the emigration was illegal, right? You know, just like. <laughs> Then you just you just got on a boat and hope you, you just made got it. on a boat and you paid a coyote the equivalent of a coyote to sail you across the Atlantic in the hopes that you would make it in one piece and be able to settle here, and there was nobody to like uh, stop you mm -hmm. from claiming a, a piece of dirt. Oh well, yeah, Ex I, except for the folks who were already except here. except for the folks who were already here, whom you probably were engaged in driving off their land. Right. Or killing. Whichever, you know. Or both. I mean, that's one way to drive them off their land, just to kill them. <laughs> or sometimes, as they say in the textbooks, they might agree to leave to make room for the settlers. That's, I was going to cite that as another story, right? We're raising our kids now with textbooks. Textbooks. That say that when the settlers arrived in America, they needed land. The America, the people who are already living there agreed to move to make room for the, the new settlers. Wasn't that nice? Yeah, uh, but the story I have about that... It's more of a guns and steel story. Well, it's a little thing I like to call the Trail of Tears. Yeah, that's, that's that story. That's one of them. Right. You know, and so uh, I don't know how to resolve this. But these things were kind of have been sort of slotting together in my head, like you know the the um, 
the idea that we communicate via stories. Well, that's it's it's actually kind of a huge thing, and it's a little strange to me that it was such a uh, sci-fi oddity, if you will. Like, yeah. oh, wouldn't this be odd? It's actually the core of how we communicate most effectively. Mm-hmm. The most effective communication is to simply evoke a story that is shared. Well, I think that was the big like um sort of conclusion of the episode is that, you know, the the um Adarians are they called Adarians? Uh t- like Tamarians. Tamarians, I'm sorry. The Tamarians, they they weren't uh this oddball. They weren't this in- yeah. these intellectual oddballs. Right. They weren't um defective in some way. No. Although they refer to them as having, you know, a different ego structure. Different ego structure. Hmm. But they but that they actually like Picard comes to deeply respect the way they communicate and he's sh- signaling this by pulling out uh his uh, copy of of Homer, Homer right. you know. The Homeric tales. The Homeric hymns as he yeah. points out. So so yeah, it's this is I think really gets at the heart of what makes human beings human beings. Yeah. yeah. The stories we tell and effectively, and this is what's interesting and this is why I think at least in the story, in the context of the story, um he was willing to die for this first contact. Our stories are how we become immortal. Yes. Yeah. I mean really, he he actually has so the captain kept his own little log in his their race's pictogram writing. Mm-hmm. Picard took it with him when he left the planet and he offered it back to the to the first officer who there's a little scene where he quickly beams it over. I mean, sort of um sort of visually it's like he's he's reclaiming the captain's soul. Yes. Right? He's sending it back to his people. Mhm. Or it's like you're going to have your heart buried under the linden tree in your home country, or something right. like that. But it's Pretty much um, that. yeah. But it's um, then the first officer reads from it, and he reads this Picard and Dathan at Eladrell because the captain, even though he was dying, apparently uh, wrote down the the story. He wrote down the story. Yeah. <laughs> for for and, his race to carry on, and I was talking earlier about reading first contact narrative. Right. First contact narratives are very you know, important in the history of science, science fiction. fiction. And this right. was a really effective one. It was really effective. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Eleanor liked Eleanor it Eleanor agrees she liked it. Oh, she's, she's picking up a lot of language, actually. She figures it's her time to ta- talk she's now. She's saying Veronica and Eleanor at it, Pittsfield Township. <laughs> <laughs> Those were good times. Yeah, yes. that's a good story. All right, so I guess we're going to wind this up. We're going to wind this up here? Okay. What did I, I had one more thing to say. If, if did I you? I remember it about um, the, way, the, the way stories are in human history, and the way we use them. It's like a form of time travel. Oh, sure. Right? Like yeah. the knowledge and the experience and the things you do and you have in one place at one time can travel forward in history. Mm-hmm. When you put it into a story, that's and, but that's also like there's a cautionary aspect to that too, which is yeah. I think we do need to be careful about what stories you tell, what stories we tell, and what stories we emphasize. Right, and the stories we just you can let have, go away. You can have a humane story about you know America built by immigrants, you know, or you can have an inhumane story about how you're. You're uh, hi- you're hiring a rat catcher to round up the rats. You can also have a truthful story. Yeah, and but about the, how America came to be. But those hateful stories that dehumanize people, mm-hmm. those kill. Yeah, yeah, they do. And so we should be cautious about the kind of story. About that kind of story. And I'm not saying we need to censor the BBC. I'm just saying I, I want to see people write more thoughtfully. Yeah. And actually recognize the power they're wielding. With their words. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's all for this week, I think. That's all for this week. we we got to take the baby take upstairs. Take the baby upstairs. If you have feedback, stuff you want us to know, let us know. Yeah, get in touch. 
you you know you can leave comments on the blog or on YouTube or um, you can tweet at me. <laughs> Grace isn't on Twitter very I much, don't but uh, I, I don't. Am I, am I on Twitter? You do have a, a Saginaw something. Oh, account. Yeah, sorry. Oops. It's, kinda, it's not very active. No, I don't think it's been active since 2011. Yeah, it's been a while. Okay, everyone. Thank you for listening. Take care. Bye-bye.